and then we'll be able to use it for um for the actual facebook group and we'll we'll put, post it up there um so who is intends so we're an international consortia um of scientists um connected together to really solve a problem um with creating um short bowel I'm sorry, to create um, intestine from short, short bowel syndrome. And we've got scientists from all over the world um, joining us. Most of them are from the EU because it's an EU funded project. So we've got people from the UK, London, Cambridge and Edinburgh and Denmark, Netherlands and the US um, and also other countries. So it's a real a collective um, effort. And with us today, we've got Professor Paolo de Coppi from UCL, and Dr. Daniel Ortman from Cambridge, and Dr. Marianne Turndrup Pedersen from Denmark. So I'm just going to let them introduce themselves. Um, would you like to go ahead, Paolo? Yes, uh, Kathy. Um, uh, uh, hi, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, um, I'm a pediatric surgeon uh, from Great Ormond Street Hospital, uh, UCL in London. And um, my work is funded uh, by the uh, NIHR um, and then the intense, of course, uh, the EU project. Uh, um, my interest is on uh, uh, treating children uh, uh, that, uh, for some uh, reason, may have lost their bowel either before birth, uh, because it may not develop in the right way, or soon after birth. And, um, and so I um, lead a team of scientists here in London that are trying to help uh, uh, the process of maybe regenerating this bowel in the laboratory to try to transplant uh, um, the bowel back uh, to the children that they've missed them. Okay, thanks Paolo. Um, and Daniel? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Daniel Ortman. I work uh, together with Ludovic Vallier here at Cambridge University and we are um, a lab specialized on pluripotent stem cells. So those are the, the stem cells that can really form any type uh, of cell in the human body and specifically for the grant we're uh, trying to make the relevant cell types that we then put together to make the intestine. So we make um, intestinal epithelial cells, we make smooth muscle cells, um, neural crest and all the different cell types that are needed for that um, and the idea is to make them from important stem cells to have a very good source of those cells and also just in case there can be no primary cells from the patient uh, recovered uh, we can actually actually just generate them from important stem cells so yeah that's what our research is about thank you daniel and and marianne Yes, hello, my name is Marianne. I'm a scientist, assistant professor working in the group of Kim Jensen in Copenhagen in Denmark. And one of the things we are working on is to understand how the intestine is formed normally, so during normal development, because in order to be able to make an intestine in the culture dish, we first need to understand how it's actually made in vivo. So we have been profiling intestinal development both in mice and humans also to give input to, for instance, the IPS differentiation that Daniel was just describing. Okay, thank you. And I'll just ask um, Zubair, who's been um, fantastic at actually supporting the connection with the short gut syndrome, who's going to be asking the questions today to the scientists. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Zubair. Uh, my full name is Zubair Siddiqui. I, I come from Kisan. I live in Saudi Arabia. I am the father of a short bowel uh, child. Um, no medical complications left. She's TPN home at last after a year old. Uh, the short gut syndrome family support group is more or less uh, the first and only family support group you come across on the internet. Uh, when you get hit with short gut, it's all of a sudden and there's no sort of knowledge around and these guys are the, usually the first people you find and usually the first people who start uh, help setting up any parent or any caregiver who is dealing with short gut. Um, there, we have over 3,700 members all across the world. 
Me, I'm in Saudi Arabia. We've got uh, members from uh, the United States. We've got members from Israel. We've got members from Singapore. So it's it's a good global group of parents, of parents, grandparents, and even in some case, people with shortcut. So it's uh, everything shortcut related uh, is discussed here, whether it comes to medical treatment, medicines, or even uh, small tips and tricks when it comes to taking care of your child. Yeah. Thank you, Zubair. Thank you. Um, and so we just thought we'd do a little bit of an introduction to what the INTENT project was. Um, so the aim of the INTENT project is, like we said before, is to reconstruct in testing for those that suffer with short bowel. And the first step is to create in testing in the lab ready to be transplanted into patients in a clinical trial. So INTENT itself doesn't have a clinical trial aspect of it. So we're not working on patients at the moment. And the main focus is to produce, it sounds a very short amount, 20 centimetres of tissue engineered for the um, duodenum. And the reason that this was, was picked is because it represents about 10% of the bowel of a newborn um, baby. And also it's the section of the intestine that has the structure for most digestion and absorption. Um, and so if we, if we just move on from there, so the things that we want to do over the five years, so the project started in 2016 um, and is finished in 2021. So we have um, five, five goals. One of them is to find the best cells to grow the intestine. The next one is the best scaffold, which the cells can grow on, to make sure that the testing that we make in the lab functions properly as in testing, to work out how to transplant it, and then lastly, is more of a regulatory aim, and that's to apply for open designation. So the process for it to become a therapy is made more smooth. Now, you might be watching this wondering what on earth all these starter cells and scaffolds and things are. So we thought we'd just give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, I've got a short video um, which shows what the structure of the intestine looks like if we had it under a microscope. So I'll just get the little video up now. Okay, sorry everyone, I'm just trying to share my screen <laughs> and I'm not having much luck. I think we might have to skip that step. So what I'll do is make sure that the videos that I was going to show are available in the Facebook group. So we'll put them alongside um, this. So basically it was to show the inside of the intestine and how the intestine is made up um, of different cells and that the cells that make the intestine, other cells, are stem cells. And it's from these stem cells that we're trying to recreate new intestine in the lab. So one of the one of the questions was about tissue engineering and the scientists will will talk about that in a little more depth in a minute but just to sort of give you an idea um if we think about engineering per se we usually think about um sort of mechanical engineering when we're thinking about designing planes or cars and the same principles apply it's to build a complex structure so we have to like work out what the best building materials are um, how to design it so it functions, and then also how to test it. And really, that's what where the phrase tissue engineering comes from. So rather than actually making a product um, using um, materials um, that are non-organic, we're actually using living material, and we're trying to work out a way of creating intestine 
um, using tissue engineering. And so if we move then on to um, our questions, um, and I'm sure the scientists are going to tell you um, more about um, the sort of how the intestine's made from here. So if I can pass you over to Zubair, um, and he's going to read the questions out, and then I'd just like to open up to the scientists are with us um, to answer the questions. So Zubair? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, all right. There are qu actually quite a lot of questions that have been beforehand, uh, mostly uh, to do with the progress and the science behind uh, tissue engineering. Uh, first, first and foremost, just for my understanding and for those who don't understand uh, tissue engineering, what exactly is the science of uh, tissue engineering? How is it different? How are stem cells different from uh, any other sort of technology that's out there? And what progress have you made? So Zubay, if, if you want, I can start. Yeah. Um, so tissue engineering is a relatively um, new type of science that combined together knowledge that is there uh, for quite some time. So like uh, cell biology, so studying the cell per se, or um, uh, material science, so engineering and so on, the study the structure of where the cells are seated. The tissue engineering try to put all together to sort of build a new organ. Until um, you know, 50 years ago, medicine was all focused on stopping diseases. So when you have the disease, uh, to try to stop the natural evolution of this disease. In the last 50 years or so, people have been concentrating more on trying to regenerate. So if you have a disease and tissue get destroyed, you may try to regenerate that tissue to make it viable again and useful again. Now, there's been tremendous uh, implement uh, of some tissue engineering aspect uh, of very simple structure. So for example, in the cornea, so the membrane that cover the eye, if you have a burning, a chemical burning on one of the cornea, one eye, they will take stem cells from the other eye, grow them on a special membrane, and then repair the uh, cornea on that has been damaged using this cell technology. This is already a clinical product to represent the gold standard. So for simple structure, uh, we, we as a community have achieved quite a lot. The same for the skin. So some of the skin can be regenerated. More complex organs are more difficult to regenerate because they require different type of cells, different type of architecture of the tissue, and so are much more complex. So that's why, for example, we have attempted this successfully in the past for the trachea, which is very different from other plastic trachea that are being used subsequently and not working. We have uh, taken trachea from a disorize, uh, uh, from a cadaver, strip out all the cells, and seeded the cells of the patient, and then transplanted in the patient that was uh, having a, a damaged trachea. So that's, um, that's uh, uh, something that has already been achieved, but the trachea, so the windpipe, is again, is a relatively simple organ. Much more different is when we discuss about the intestine, that as you know very well, has various functions, such as absorption of nutrients, secretion, and the movement that allow the bolus of food to go through from the top to the bottom. So these are all very specialized functions that are very difficult to replicate. And it's possible that the first intestine that will be engineered, so made in the laboratory, that's why it's called engineer, 
will have one or two of those functions, but not all of them. I hope these answer your question. Yes, quite, uh, quite, ex uh, quite a lot, actually. Uh, so how much uh, progress have you made in uh, your engineering of, uh, the, of an intestine? So at, at the moment, uh, I think we are able to culture different cell type uh, out of the intestine. So you can take uh, cells from the intestine and culture outside the intestine or even make new cells that are similar to the intestine. And uh, Daniel and Marianne will talk about those specifics. Uh, what we can also achieve is to have a, an intestine uh, strip out. So all the cells of a cadaveric intestine can be stripped out from, from the structure. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to seed these cells derived from the patient into the intestine. We have obtained some preliminary data, but we're still not able to build uh, uh, the entire intestine. And I don't know if Daniel and Marianne wants to talk a bit about the cells. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe I can say something about the, the progress about generating those cells, especially from pluripotent stem cells. So, so this is what we are doing. And uh, in that respect, actually, pluripotent stem cells are really a great source to um, really make any cell type that we want to use for a therapy. And uh, so what we've been doing over the last few years is uh, we've tried, well, we figured out actually ways to make the major cell types um, of the small intestine that we're going to use. And uh, not only that, but we also had to figure out um, not only to make intestinal cells, but also to make the right region of intestinal cells. And we, we think we've actually managed to have that process down quite well now um, so that we can actually now make the major building blocks of what Kathy was talking about. Like engin engineering is about having the right kind of building blocks and then putting them together in the right way to achieve a functional um, construct at the end. So like, well, it's not an airplane, but it's a, it's a small intestine. And so we're at the stage now where we have the building blocks and now we need to figure out the best ways to put them together to make really um, a small intestine that can also absorb nutrients and fulfill all the function that we need it to do. Yeah, I can add a few comments because now one of your question was, what is a stem cell? And um, that's a term we use a lot. And basically, so a stem cell is a cell that can both make replicates of itself, so it can make exact copies of itself, and it can also make different specialized cell types. So in the intestine, we all the time have stem cells dividing, giving, making up the entire epithelium. And that is something we now know how to culture. So put have in the lab and make them expand and grow so we can make more of the intestinal epithelium. And as Daniel is discussing, then there's also these, so stem cells intestine can only make intestine, but we can also work with these induced pluripotent stem cells, which actually have the potential of being becoming everything. And in the intense consortium, we now have protocols for making these induced pluripotent stem cells into intestine. So stem cells are very central for the whole intense project. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Zubair, do you want to? Yeah, I'll jump ahead to the next slide, uh, ask a few more questions. Uh, okay. Yeah. In the course of your research, have you, uh, is, has, has everything been sort of smooth sailing? Have you found what you're expecting to find or have there been surprises along the way? Any unexpected results? Good, bad, neutral? Is there anyone who would like to, Paolo? I think it's, uh, it's uh, part of science that most of the results are unexpected in the sense that you move along and you find uh, um, different things than what you expected. However, uh, some aspects are actually better than expected itself in the sense that 
one example that I can bring is that uh, we were very worried about the blood supply on the intestine because um, uh, this is a very major limitation of any tissue engineering tissue that uh, if you don't have a good blood supply, you cannot uh, provide uh, um, the delivery of the organ in vivo. And, uh, and at the beginning, we thought that this would have been very difficult, but now we're using some cells that has a, have allowed us to actually uh, repopulate the old vasculature, so all the blood vessels that bring the blood to the intestine uh, without much of a problem. So this is a surprise in a positive way that we thought was going to be a major limitation. I'm sure Daniel and Marianne have plenty of uh, surprise uh, from the, I mean, positive and negative, of course, uh, uh, in, in on their research as well. Uh, Marianne? Daniel is, Daniel. Um, yeah, I, I can say some, well, I'm, as Paula said, like, uh, well, research is a, is a process where you, always encounter at least little surprises because what we're also dealing with is, is um, the unknown. Um, otherwise, like we wouldn't have to invest time and energy to, to find out new things. Um, I mean, like, I agree with Paolo majorly what, what we um, set out to do in this intense consortium um, uh, wasn't like a huge surprise because it's more of a process of like trying to figure out ways to make the right cells, put them on the right scaffold. Um, so from that, like the, the overall strategy isn't, um, hasn't really taken any major turns, I would say. Um, however, of course, there's always little details of like, how do you make the right cell type? You, you think um, like um, a certain protocol is gonna get you there, but then you have to change and uh, adapt a little bit. So like those are the little things, uh, I guess, that are always um, involved in research, I guess. Yes, and yeah. I can only agree that we, of course, also by, um, so on our side, as I said, we've been profiling intestinal development. And of course, if, if we knew what we were going to find, we wouldn't have done it. So there's been many unexpected results in that way. But as Dan has also pointed out, um, not anything that has specifically hampered the process. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is possibly the most common question uh, that's been asked is over the course of your studies, uh, have you, obviously we all know that the short bowel syndrome is a result of uh, surgeries and the underlying cause for that surgery is a variety of different reasons, whether it's necrotizing endocarditis, whether it's uh, gastrochysis, atresia, stenosis, whatever. Uh, and uh, have you ever come across any underlying cause that would cause any of these in babies? Uh, yeah. Or even adults, for that matter. Yeah, maybe you can answer this question. Um, yes, uh, we do see commonly uh, in children uh, uh, the major cause of short bowel which is uh, uh, for us in children is certainly uh, our gastroschisis uh, and necrotizing enterocolitis uh, in terms of major surgical cause. There are other causes such as severe dysmotility in which you lose your bowel because it's not functional, but not because you lose it physically. But the results is the same. As you know, the results of um, uh, uh, of the the the, uh, the best treatments that are around uh, are, are not exceptionally good, and uh, therefore these children end up being on TPN uh, or some uh, if they reach the age that they can undergo, they will undergo transplantation. Um, but particularly in children, also because uh, of the match problem, 
it's uh, they are not ideal treatment for those children. But yes, we do see uh, in all centers that are involved uh, in the research, we do see children and some also adults uh, with those conditions. Okay, thanks, Paolo. Um, Sue Baird, do you want to move on to the next question? Yeah, sure. Uh, the next question, I think, has more to do with the qualification of uh, someone who would to have go undergo the stem cell treatment. Uh, someone already said that it, it's taken from a, a sample taken from the patient themselves. Uh, what sort of qu uh, qualification criteria would you have for that patient? Does that patient need to have any intestine or can it be grown from uh, say a, a living donor like a parent uh, a close relative the child itself another organ so here there are more than one question i will um uh, answer part of the question then we'll leave it to daniel and marianne to discuss more the cellular question uh, if we want to engineer an intestine, and I want to make it clear that we are not at the stage where we envisage now to do any clinical trial, but in the future we'll be using a scaffolding, so a structure that will hold the cells that will either be derived from a cadaver, which will remove all the cellular components of the organ and we transfer the cell of the patient or we'll be using a synthetic scaffold so something done in the laboratory using chemicals in which the cells feel good so they can uh, uh, expand so for more cells and also function so this scaffolding then will be populated with different cell type uh, and in terms of the donor, I think uh, uh, Daniel and Marianne will be discussing uh, uh, more about the cells and when they, where they can derive. Um, uh, Marianne, would you want to start? Yes, I can do that. So as we, now we mentioned the concept of stem cells before. So, so one approach here is to, as you mentioned yourself, if you have, if there is a child that has some parts of the intestine left then cells from these parts of the intestine can be cultured in the lab and put together on a scaffold and used to make the remaining intestine. But as you say, if the child has no intestine, then that obviously is not an option. But then the technology of induced pluripotent stem cells come into play. So now it's actually possible to take an unrelated cell, like for instance a skin cell, and put some factors into it and in that way converted to what we call an induced pluripotent stem cell, which has the capability of becoming everything. And with the expertise of, for instance, Daniel, what we are trying to find out is how to make these induced pluripotent stem cells into functional intestine that could be used for transplantation. So in theory, what we are trying to do is also to make solutions for children without an intestine. Yeah, I think that, that's, uh, I agree very much with Marianne. Um, I just wanted to add on that maybe also for the case that uh, the child still has the intestine and we, we can actually take a little bit of uh, the patient's own cells, um, it might still be necessary to make some of the other cell types from pluripotent stem cells because right now um, it's like the technology is there to expand the epithelial cells so that's the the kind of the major lining of the gut however some of the other cell types like uh, that are responsible for motility or like innervation or blood supply um, they cannot be expanded so well from a primary patient sample so in those cases uh, you might actually have to also supplement those cells um, with um, important stem cell derived cells um, and another thing is, of course, uh, because you were also um, asking about um, getting the cells from a relative. Um, so there we are dealing with uh, questions about immune rejection. So ideally, with with the methodology that we we described, um, you would you wouldn't need 
um, major immune suppression because it would be the patient's own cells. However, if you take them from another donor, um, a family member, then the immune system might not be completely compatible and then you are relying on more of an immune suppression just to uh, avoid rejection of, of the tissue engineered organ. And I don't know if that answers your question then. Yeah, it, it kind of does. Uh, just a little add on to this. Uh, all of this development, can it be done uh, to all three portions of the intestine? Uh, the colon, the duodenum, ileum, duodenum? Or is it just for the small bowel? Um, so we are also working on uh, methods to um, specifically generate one or the other type of intestine. And we, we've developed protocols that allow us to uh, um, make cells that are more similar to like small intestine or large intestine. Um, so that, that's definitely possible. Of course, there would also be a little bit of a different process behind the tissue engineering of those structures because, I mean, for, for one, the, the um, large intestine is, is bigger. You need like probably a different make, matrix as well to, to make that. Um, but yeah, in principle, it's possible to do it for all the different segments. Yes, and I can add that we also we have all the different segments growing in laboratory and we can also see that, for instance, if we take cells from some part of the small intestine and, and culture it in the laboratory, it still remembers, so to say, that it is that part of the small intestine. So in that way, the identity and the functionality should be preserved. Uh, will, the, will any engineered sort of intestine that, that is created carry the same uh, problems that cause the short bowel in, in the first place. We've got uh, issues like necrotizing NEC, we've got issues like this motility. It will, will these be transferred onto the new intestine that you've engineered or is there some sort of check and balance in place where you can sort of filter these out? That, that's a very important point. I think uh, we don't know um, how much uh, the new intestine will assemble the characteristic of the initial cells. But it is uh, likely to envisage that some of the um, uh, problem uh, that the, uh, the intestine in the first instant had, uh, if we don't go through a process of regenerating from truly stem cells, as Marianne and Daniel were talking, we may get into the same issue at the end. This is quite clearly in case of this motility, um, but uh, it's possible that when the intestine is missing because of the surgical reason, like gastroscisis or necrotizing entrocolitis, so it's being lost, so it's left with a short, the true short bowel, a surgical short bowel, then making intestine from those cells, uh, they will still be okay, they will likely to be okay. So it's a, it's a, a very important question, but it's, the answer is quite complex because uh, there's no straightforward answer to this. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I would understood. Uh, now, the, the assumption here is that anything that would be grown in a laboratory would be transplanted uh, surgically. Uh, uh, surgery sort of have come with their own inherent risks. Uh, I, I guess Daniel already covered the, uh, the point about immunosuppression and anti-rejection. Uh, what about other sort of complications that come with uh, transplants and surgeries, such as ulcers, cancers, uh, would, could, could the intestine die? Uh, can it, would it act like a normal intestine? Yeah, I may, I may say something about that. Uh, is um, uh, um, the, this, um, I mean, we are not so ambitious at the moment to be able to recreate an entire intestine. And I think uh, that in terms of all length, huh? and um, uh, many of the complications that you mentioned, they are due to the, to the fact that it's a transplant between two different individuals. 
the advantage of the tissue engineering in testing will be that the cells that will be transplanted will not uh, go through the same type of rejection that the normal intestine goes through when it's transplanted on a different individual. You have to imagine that uh, the intestine, beside the function of, of course, absorption and so on, is one of the organs that contain more lymphatic system or, or, or um, uh, more immunogenic system than any other organ because of all the um, of the cells of the immune system that are normally contained on the intestine. So when uh, there is a, a cells that the body doesn't recognize, that cells is attacked. And even if we use potent immunosuppression, there's a sort of a chronic inflammation that can be generated. So what uh, uh, we avoid if we have a, a, an engineering intestine is totally we avoid this response. So it's unlikely to have the problem that we normally see in intestine when it get transplanted. Okay, thanks Paolo. I think we've just lost Zubair for a moment. Um, so Hi, yes. Are you here? Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah, yeah Welcome back. I lost the whole previous part. Uh, I'll catch up on the in the recording on it. Uh, so should we proceed? I'm not sure how much of his answer he was through. Yeah, I think I think we covered. We were talking about we covered about immunosuppression, and we've also covered what Paolo was talking about was about it acting, whether it would act like a normal intestine and it dying, and then talking about the the challenges of transplant when you're transplanting a whole organ. Um, right. So I think we've probably covered that. Um, so I guess we could move on to the questions about safety. Yes, let's uh, move on to the questions about safety. Uh, again, I think I'm not sure if this was covered in Paolo's last answer, but are there any possible side effects that could occur uh, with even if it is a, uh, an intestine grown from your own stem cells and the risk of rejection is low? Are there any other possible uh, side effects of transplanting more or less uh, an engineered product? Ha has it been done before? any sort of stem cell grown organ transplanted into any sort of living being? I'm just curious. Yes, so uh, so very few examples uh, of a complex engineer organ have been done before. I was mentioning before about the trachea, the windpipe that has been transplanted uh, successfully into children here at Great Home Street Hospital, um, but I suppose these numbers are still small to make any definitive conclusion. So it can be done, it's safe, and so far we haven't seen uh, developing of tumor, for example, that you were alluding to before. Uh, there are more numbers on the cornea that I was discussing at the beginning, and on those is very safe. So they haven't seen any ab abnormal development. Of course, more we use uh, complex cells and multiple cell type, and more we could uh, potentially transplant an organ that could be dangerous. But uh, our aim is to do all this understanding and development before transplanting any patient uh, in the preclinical setting. I don't know if uh, Daniel and Marianne wants to add on this point. I mean, I agree with you, Paolo. Um, the more the complexity increases, the more the um, possible things that can go wrong. I mean, not only that uh, something, you know, grows uncontrollably, like in the in the case of cancer, but then we're we're also trying to minimize all those risks. But also just the fact that you have a lot of cell types that are uh, trying to maintain the function of the organ, and at some point that uh, might not. Uh, go as well, especially with the cell types that we're using. So like there, those cell types aren't um, as used to functioning in, in this respect as as have like the, the, the cells of the normal intestine. So we would have to see if um, 
we can then make this tissue engineered organ that would then also long term provide functionality. And um, yeah, those are all things that, uh, of course, as Paolo said, uh, we need to study before we actually go into a patient and put them at risk of either like the transplant doing something wrong or the transplant not really functioning properly. Hi, Marianne, have you got anything to add? Sorry. Sorry, I think I've lost connection with but but actually no, I don't have much to add. I think uh, I think the the question was answered, yeah. Okay, I think just before I think Anne has got her hand up. Um Anne, did you want to ask something about that? Uh, no, but I, I would like to focus a little on uh, those children who doesn't have any uh, small bound left. And uh, would you consider that to be a more complex situation uh, than if you had to have a little small bound uh, left? And are there any specific uh, problems uh, for that situation? And uh, would it take longer time for you to create a small bound for that type of, of children? I think uh, I think, and as I think uh, Marianne and Dania were alluding before, I think that situation is not much more complex than children that would have bowel left, in the sense that uh, uh, the protocols are quite robust now on taking cells from the skin or fibroblast and. Um, and men generating different cell type from that. But I, I will leave uh, Daniel or Marianne to ex uh, really go more into that. So uh, uh, we'll give you opportunity to make it even more clear what we are discussing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Paolo. I mean, essentially the, the situation is the same because in both cases we need to um, make the right cell types in the lab. So either we take um, some of the intestinal stem cells and cell types that are there from the patient, uh, also take them into the lab, expand them, and then have to put them again together in this uh, tissue engineered construct. Or as Marianne was, was explaining, we can take, uh, well, we can take cell types, for example, skin cells from the patients, make them into IPS through this uh, reprogramming process, um, and then uh, um, derive the cell types from the pluripotent stem cells and then run, run through the same thing. And right now, I mean, like the a major challenge is really the, the tissue engineering aspect to, to put the cell types um, together. And that, all that process is pretty much the same, whether you start from, um, from patients' uh, intestine or from stem cells. Hi Anne, does, is, does that make it? Or do you want to? Do yes, want absolutely. To it was absolutely much more clear. Are there any specific uh, problems connected uh, to, to the process of uh, developing a small bowel where they don't have any in the beginning uh, with the immune suppression uh, system or the cancer problem or any other related uh, problems? No, I think. Uh, Can you hear? Me? I think uh, there's not um, any additional specific problem to that. It goes um, together with any other throat bowel syndrome, um, and I I don't envisage that will be more difficult. Um, it's possible that those children, because of don't have other solution may even be the first to receive this type of bowel um, because of there's no alternative treatments. And um, so, of course, uh, when it comes to the point of translating, uh, even if uh, um, we have to make sure first that the, the treatment is safe, uh, 
and is at least comparable to other treatment in terms of efficiency. Um, children that do not have any small bowel may be the one that um, will benefit uh, these first. Have you any 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 idea about when you will be ready to make a transplant? Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to answer this question because um, uh, we we aim uh, um, initially for 2021 to have uh, um, an engineer bowel that could somehow be transplanted um, and and we've been amazed by the results that not only our group uh, our groups uh, but other groups uh, also have been producing in the last couple of years so it's of course a matter of investment most people working in one, on one topic and uh, um, a more development and uh, efficiency will be um, the, um, the, the as I say before the bowel that will be maybe ready in a few years time to be transplanted may be very different to the bowel as its entire function so it may have the absorption and secretion uh, may not have the um, other of the function of the bowel. So it, it's possible in a few years' time we'll be ready to have something that will be transplantable. Uh, we believe strongly that this will be likely more to benefit children than adults because initially of the size, but also because of how children grow themselves and how their bowel grow and so on. Um, but it is difficult to predict the exact time. I don't know if uh, Marianne or Daniel want to say more on that. I think, I mean, yeah, you, you covered pretty well, I think. Nothing to add. I'm sorry, I have some technical problems here, so I can't really, my connection keeps failing. No, I mean, uh, um, uh, Marianne uh, Ann was asking about timing uh, for seeing this inpatient. Uh, uh, and just uh, wanted to hear your comments as well. I think we've lost, we've lost Marianne again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anna, does it uh, make it more clear what we say? Yes, it's it's fine, Paul. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Anne. And then Zubair, I think we we've got to the end of the questions of the group that sent them through. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to ask? Yeah, actually, quite a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to go, start going through the list that people sort of posted online. Uh, but okay. first, I, I actually have a follow up question uh, uh, for what Anne just asked. Uh, she was asking about timings of about, about uh, when people can go to go inpatient. I, I'd like to know what uh, the team's milestones are. How, how have you sort of spaced this out? What are you looking to do in what year? Uh, like, when do you intend to have your first development test in? When do you intend to have your first transplant? Uh, stuff like that. Just in terms of milestones, how long do you do you look at the whole project? I think we lost Jan. Yeah, I think we've lost. We have lost Jan um, and Marianne. We've lost as well. We still got Paolo and Daniel. Yeah, we're still here. Yeah. So timing, as I say before. Uh, is very difficult to predict. Uh, we aim at having a, a basic testing uh, uh, ready for the end of the project. So in, in the next uh, two or three years, we aim to have a rudimental intestine. From that to go to patient is a bit difficult to predict. 
Uh, but what I'm more interested about is that the amazing results that have been produced by the groups in the last few years, and as I say, not only from our consortium, but from other groups uh, around the world, have uh, made me very exciting because uh, what you learn by studying the process of the tissue engineering of the intestine may be actually be useful for these children in other ways. So in other children, you may not need to transplant an intestine, you may need to transplant cells that has been developed during these and other projects uh, and may have children recovery from the uh, bowel failure without having to transplant the old intestine. Think about the dysmotility. If you can generate neuro cells that will be able to make the bowel moving, coordinating in the nice way, uh, and we are working with these cells as well, uh, you will not need to transplant a new intestine in these children. So that's why I'm very excited about this consortium and other groups that are working on the bowel tissue engineering because all the results that will be produced in this uh, type of sense on aiming and engineering a bowel will actually be useful for developing all other therapies for children. So ultimately will be very helpful for therapies. So what other sort of uh, therapies do you foresee coming as a result of this? Are you look uh, has there been any evidence that this might turn into a, some sort of vaccine, some sort of uh, medicine, or uh, is it just sort of going to be the physical transplant? Uh, Daniel, do you want to answer this? Um, I mean, it, it's it's always a little bit difficult to foresee um, things that you can find along the, the way because, uh, I mean, a lot of those possibilities are unknown, but uh, as Paolo mentioned, uh, you know, studying the different cell types and how they contribute to the function of this organ um, can give us um, new possibilities um, to, for example, yeah, treat treat issues like motility. If if we understand uh, exactly how how the bowel becomes dysmotel and like which cell types and which connections are disrupted then we can really like work specifically on those uh, few without maybe having to um, you know like transplant the whole intestine but maybe we, we can really um, adjust this little piece of the whole puzzle um, which which then of course is better you know the the, the minor the adjustment the, the better it is like you don't have to go through a major surgery then maybe ideally but it, it, it is extremely hard to predict uh, what you find along the way, because otherwise uh, we would already be looking specifically in that direction if, if it was something very obvious. So, like, uh, it's a little bit of an unsatisfying answer, but uh, it's it's always hard to tell what you will find along the way. My phone, uh, microphone was off, but that does answer the question quite a lot. I, I know it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what about uh, does this do stem cell therapies? This is another question somebody else asked. Do stem cell therapies will they uh, apply to children who wouldn't otherwise survive uh, the the underlying cause for short bowel syndrome? As you probably do already know, that some people are given that option pre-surgery. Uh, so will this sort of apply to all? Uh, of the underlying causes for uh, short bowel, or just the top few? I know that question was badly worded, but I'm sure you get the idea. Uh, so, if uh, the if I understood correct, is that if uh, um, if the background. Uh, uh, condition uh, as the influence on the engineering testing? Yes. Yeah. The, uh, I, think it, uh, I think I can be a little bit more clear on this. Yeah. Um, more, uh, more in the sense of uh, in the certain, in the case of a worst case scenario, certain parents are given uh, 
all three of your uh, non-stomach anatomy is going to be removed, the, ch the chance for ch child survival, survival is more or less little or none. Uh, in in that sort of a scenario, I guess this goes back to the can, can all three uh, portions of the anatomy be created? Uh, is this a viable? Or will this be hopefully a viable option for children like that? Uh, yeah, eventually, yes. I mean, at this stage, uh, we are still very preliminary, so it's difficult. But if this will work, uh, um, the engineering testing will be a viable option in these various conditions. So um, we believe that while the way of engineering and testing may be different, so as I say before, in this motility, different from neck, uh, different from gastroschisis, and so on, then ultimately the in testing that would be engineer would be useful for all these patients. Hi Zubed, answer the question. I just think your microphone's off. Hi, yeah, I, yeah, that does answer the question. I just realized my mic was off. I was uh, asking actually a follow-up question from, uh, from the same person who asked this one. Uh, and it's more about the iliocal valve. Uh, does tissue, in, through tissue engineering, through stem cells, can you develop uh, the iliocal valve or are you, we still at uh, the intestinal tubular tracts? Um, so maybe I can answer that. So, I mean, in principle, it's also possible. It's not a direction that we're specifically going down to uh, with the intense consortium. So like, with the intense consortium, first of all, it's for us important to make a functional small intestine in terms of resorptive function, um, like barrier function, all this stuff. Uh, we haven't looked into generating valves, but then, of course, um, uh, we can, in principle, with this approach, uh, generate any of the structures that are there in the body as well, because we can make the right cell types and we can make the right structure. And, and therefore, um, a similar approach would also be working uh, to generate the valves. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm just uh, quickly reading my, all the questions I've got. Um, I've got quite a lot of questions regarding the risk of cancer uh, using stem cells. So can you please touch upon that one more time? Yeah, sure. Um, no problem. Um, so I think there is a... Um, yeah, th there is always the possibility if you use stem cells that you can get uncontrolled growth. However, um, whenever we, we make actually a certain cell type out of, out of stem cells, we have to make sure that um, all the stem cells have turned into that cell type because if, if they haven't, then uh, yeah, you can get a problem with uncontrolled growth. But the more we understand about the process, um, you know, with the stem cells, how you control them, how you make the right cell type, uh, the better the control is. And like, there's actually a, a, a wide variety of stem cell um, related treatments out there. I mean, so, uh, if you remember what Marianne said earlier about actually like more tissue specific stem cells and pluripotent stem cells. So the tissue specific stem cells, um, they are used in, uh, in therapies for, for decades. For example, bone marrow transplantation is always the, the, like the best and clinically most widespread uh, application for stem cells. So there you use uh, bone marrow stem cells to um, repopulate the, the blood system, right? And that, that's actually something that um, is working very well and like there is actually not really major issues with that. I mean, of course, yeah, you can also get cancers, but then like they can can be um, occurring spontaneously. So that it's not necessarily related to the treatment itself. And similar um, things apply to this as well. So like if we actually uh, take good care of um, uh, using good cells and differentiating them correctly and, and producing the right cell types for the intestine, then the risk of uh, 
cancer is developing is, is very, very minimal. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we're down to the last two questions that I've got written down. Um, assume, uh, uh, I realize that this is a f uh, f fair ways into the future, but assuming that you guys can be successful in turning this into a viable treatment option, what sort of process would it look like for, uh, for a patient? Say someone comes in, I have short bowel syndrome, what do you do next? I know that's a very simple way of asking the question, but I guess simplicity is the best. Yeah, so the, the with short bowel syndrome, the uh, first uh, will be, as Daniel Mariana says, you can derive cells either from the intestine itself or from other cells like the skin. So we will probably envisage to try both ways. So the cells can be derived using an endoscopy, so that uh, uh, and require general anesthetic in children. You can take the cells uh, from the intestine itself and from skin, and then try both process of expanding these cells in vitro uh, in the culture lab uh, while the scaffolding, so the structure where you're seeding the cells, get prepared in the lab. So that will be the first step. And then uh, there will be other evaluation in terms of absorption and nutrient and so on, because it's possible that a patient that is on, let's say, 30% of TPN and 70% feeding, may need less intestine of someone that is on 70% TPN and 30% of feeding. Hi, uh, what do you mean by scaffolding? So the scaffolding is the cells needs to have a structure where to be seated like the intestine, as you know, is a tube that is formed by cells that are on, seated on the scaffold, and the scaffold, which is the matrix where the cells are seated. Are you talking about a physical instrument as a scaffolding, or? Correct, uh, correct. So or, it, it is, a, it is a tube. So you grow it around sort of a tube, so it grows in the same right shape. All right. Um, uh, final question. Uh, as parents of, uh, final question from my side, I'm not sure what if Maria and Anne want to ask more. Uh, is As parents of uh, short bowel children, is there any sort of assistance you would need from us? Is there any way we can help or participate? Uh, Daniel, do you want to say? I mean, I, I can't really comment on uh, clinically because I mean, I guess your your question would would be um, maybe more related to like the the clinical implications of of that. I think. Oh, I, I think I think uh, I think it's more if I understand correct, Zubay, it's more in general how families can help us moving on with the project, right? Yeah, yeah bas basically in any way, shape, or form, can we help okay. provide, is there any I mean, data set you'd need? Uh, I, I think, so, one thing that's always good is, is the dialogue, like, similar to what we're having right now. So, like, um, things that you um, are struggling with, things that you, you would be, like, expecting, or, like, something that you would wish for. Uh, that you mentioned this, that we are aware of this, that we feedback to you how how our progress is. I think that that always helps to uh, um, both sides to actually like improve what they're doing. Um, and another thing is actually um, a lot of times for research we we need um, like patients willing to participate in in clinical uh, research, both you know giving just giving samples um, to to understand the underlying causes of the disease, but then also, you know, like uh, signing up for, for trials and like really testing the, the therapies out. I mean, like it's, it's um, I think for that, the, this willingness to 
also engage with the researchers and also participate in the research is, uh, is really helping a lot to, uh, for us to also progress. Yeah, if I can add, thank you, Daniel, if I can add on that, the other thing is that you are much more powerful than us is to lobbying. You know, on lobbying uh, government, foundations, and so on. And, and, you know, our example is very clear. I mean, uh, on uh, and her two children uh, help putting this project together. I mean, they're very humble, but actually literally they were able to lobby for uh, these two stars and uh, you know to make an example you know parkinson and other diseases that are i mean there are more people involved and so therefore the more lobby to the government and so on uh, receive much more funding uh, that uh, um uh, orphan disease like short bowel and they are already approaching clinical trial with cellular therapy because more people work on one topics and uh, and more actually results are obtained so you as families are very powerful uh, because you can drive where the fundings of the government or charities go so um, we we work very much with you guys because you understand what you want, so you can drive our research, but also you can help us making that successful. Yeah, I fully agree with that. So it, it's really um, the more the more you're excited about the possibilities of you know stem cells and tissue engineering and that research, the more and the more you talk about about that to other people, maybe like other families. Um, funding bodies, uh, the better it is or the easier it will also be for us to, to get people working on it, to get more funds for it and to really solve those problems. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, from my side, that would be the, that was the last question. Um, I don't know if Mar uh, Maria or Anne has any more. I'd like to bring up one just thing that, uh, I I feel it's important to mention right now after the uh, this whole conversation. Um, somebody in Rhode Island, I'm not, I don't remember the name, has managed to make August uh, Short Bowel Syndrome Awareness Month in in Rhode Island and Massachusetts inside the United States. This is I just happened recently. So, in terms of lobbying, I think uh, some people have the right idea, and we're on some track, and we'll get somewhere. Soon, I guess. So, that's, that's Maria, like yeah. So, if Maria and Anne have any more questions, uh, feel free to jump in, please. Uh, I think it has been very helpful to have this discussion, and maybe we could have it uh, in the future too. So, that's more for Kathy to organize within a year or two for the group so we could follow up on the questions. Hi Anne, yeah it's been a, a real pleasure to work actually developing today with Zubair and yourself um, and I think it's it's sort of really sort of uh, moving on from what Daniel said it's like keeping the dialogue open so I'm hoping that tonight well tonight isn't just a one-off event but it's a an open way into um, the collaboration between yourselves as families that are affected by short bowel um, and the intense consortia that are, you know, where their work is for trying to regenerate the um, bowel for, um, for a therapy for short bowel. So just want to say actually thank you to Anne and Zubair and, and very much so um, we'd see this as an extended dialogue. Yeah, we'd like to continue this dialogue into the future. Uh, I agree with Anne and Catherine completely. Yeah, I think it's very important for us because uh, it drives uh, then the research that we do. Okay, so thank you, Zubair. Um, 
Maria's, I think, just just well put. So to bring the this evening to a close, um, just to say as well, I just put this slide up, which will be recorded. There's more information about the Intense Consortium on our website, and more generally, there's a huge resource on the European um, website, Euro Stem Cell, and which is as information not just about the use of stem cells in um, developing in testing, but the use of stem cells in a whole range of conditions and also background information about what stem cells are. Um, and please, if you've got any um, questions about what's been said um, in this event, um, please do post um, on the Facebook thread. And I'm, I thank in advance Zubair and um, Anne for helping facilitate that. And it really leaves me just to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you particularly to Zubair and Anne um, for supporting and facilitating um, tonight and to the scientists who have given up um, their, their time and given their energy to um, the conversation. So Paolo de Coppi, Marianne Turndrup, Pedersen and Daniel Ortman. So thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good night, thank you. Good night. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.